It felt like a beautifully intended tribute to say goodbye, goodbye to our show, goodbye to our story, and goodbye to Queen Elizabeth, says Suzanne Mackey of the last scene in the final episode of the Netflix drama. The final six episodes of The Crown have arrived on Netflix, concluding a decade of work that culminated in the fictionalized retelling of Queen Elizabeth II's 70-year reign over the United Kingdom. Written and created by Peter Morgan in 2016, the six-season series began with the then-Princess of York's Claire Foy, 1947 marriage to Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and now ends with her son, Prince Charles's, Dominic West, wedding to Camilla Parker Bowles, Olivia Williams, just as Morgan imagined from the outset. Peter knew right at the beginning, 10 years ago, that it would be 2005. Executive producer Suzanne Mackey told The Hollywood Reporter in a previous interview. He always said, I want to end around the time when Camilla and Charles got married. In closing out the complex love story of the future king and queen, the series sets the stage for the chronicling of the next successors to the throne, Prince William Ed McVeigh and Catherine Middleton, Meg Bellamy whose budding romance is explored in part two of the final season of the fictionalized drama. In a way, what we were trying to do by reconciling Kate and William at the end of episode nine was then have the final reconciliation, if you like, between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, in that they would finally be allowed to marry. Mackey tells THR in the follow-up conversation below about the final episodes. Those couples coming together felt like a beautiful end to our story. That, in a way, peace is restored to the land. Yet the unexpected passing of Queen Elizabeth, who died during filming of the final season on September 8, 2022, added an additional layer of anticipation for audiences who were already curious as to how her personal tale would draw to a close. In the series finale, the three actresses who have portrayed the Queen over the course of the show's six seasons, Foy, seasons one and two, Olivia Colman, seasons three and four, and Imelda Staunton, seasons five and six appear on screen together for the first time as the British monarch reflects on her longevity as the head of state and embraces her duty to remain in that seat for the eternity of her life. That felt like a profound note to end on, that there was something very simple and dignified and gracious, not least because, of course, in the time of Peter writing it, we didn't know that the Queen would die, and of course she did, explains Mackie. So it also felt like a beautifully intended tribute to her to say goodbye, goodbye to our show, goodbye to our story and goodbye to her. What he said immediately, and I think he said this not just because he felt he'd trodden this story well already, but because he felt there was another part of that story that he really wanted to examine, which was the Alphayettes. Right at the beginning, 10 years ago, he said, I really want to talk about the Alphayettes and the impact of Dodie's death on them, and I remember at the time thinking, wow, that is so interesting and so bold. It allows him to explore multiculturalism and how al Fayed somehow had never been accepted and it's a sort of classic, in a way, archetypal story of a father wanting so much for his son and by doing so, almost the consequences of that, of wanting it so badly, are tragic. It's a terrible sense of destiny. It felt almost like a Greek tragedy. So I think, for a long time, that became something that he wanted to explore. So he set that up in season 5. The Alphayeds became a very important part of our landscape for the final two seasons because, in many ways, the Alphayeds were a dynasty themselves and a family. And in the end, the crown is a family drama, so you're colliding two very high profile, very dynamic, rich, wealthy, privileged families, and all the dysfunction that goes with that. That suddenly felt really interesting. And that was the perspective that Peter had found that felt very different to anything he'd examined in the film The Queen. But then when it actually came to telling the story, I think he felt he knew he needed to explore why the Queen didn't immediately rush down to London to accept or embrace the public hysteria that she withheld from it. And I think that, in the end, was something he wanted to explore again. It was an interesting journey. Are there any critical reactions to part one that you'd like to respond to or clear up? Well, yes. One never wants to sound defensive, and I'm too long in the tooth and philosophical about it, but I'd say the thing that might have been slightly misunderstood was the ghosts, because they were never intended as ghosts. I think for anyone that's experienced sudden grief, or grief generally, and the intensity of grief, the realization that someone is simply not there anymore is so hard to comprehend. You feel a need, and indeed even therapists would encourage a conversation with that person. I think the essence of Diana was so strong. She was such a life force that it was incomprehensible that she simply wasn't there anymore. Peter wrote it very spontaneously. I remember it so well, where we were and what I was doing, 
and he shared it with a couple of us, and I read it in the spirit of what I think was intended. It was Prince Charles having a conversation out of sheer guilt and the intensity of shock. He almost wanted Prince Charles to be able to say, I'm sorry, and goodbye. So I understood what Peter was writing. I think we all understood it, and certainly the actors understood it. I think somehow the word ghost was misunderstood, and it therefore would be very easy to think, well, that's a bit of a cheap gimmick, and yet it was so the opposite. It was written from a place of deep connection to Peter, who has lots of this experienced grief. Peter always writes from a very deep place within himself. He never writes casually. He never writes superficially. It's always very connected into something he would feel profoundly aware of. So it felt like we were having our nose rubbed into something that wasn't intended. When I spoke with Annie Sulzberger, she said she didn't feel it was her right to pass on any feedback from the royal family on the series. Have you received any response that you'd be open to sharing, either from them or the Spencer family? No, we've always had, I hope, a healthy distance between us and them and what, I hope, again, is intended as a very respectful distance. That it would be somehow wrong of us to talk to them directly or for them to talk to us directly. I think it's a sort of tacit understanding that we do what we do. We would never do it to cause offense or to be disrespectful. We've always been very respectful. Peter, simply as a writer, just writes and wants to tell the story as he perceives it. And in the end, it is an interpretation. It's Peter Morgan's interpretation of this monarchy, this family of people. I've been involved in lots of true stories in my career, and it's hard to be too close to the false material because you're then beholden. But equally, Peter's writing is based on a lot of very rigorous research from people like Annie. He builds up a picture that does, I feel, have an approximation of truth. It's his interpretation of the family, the monarchy, and the institution as he perceives it.